been I, the last time I saw you with Yardbirds, you were playing at yeah. I think the Canyon Club. Canyon, How long Canyon was that? Club. Yeah. yeah, that's about four years ago or something. Yeah, so about four years. So okay. you, you have you not been in LA since then? I don't know. No, I have not. Oh, oh well, okay. actually, um, maybe I was out uh, the year before the pandemic, or I was out with some friends of mine that I play with here in the Pennsylvania area. Uh -huh. We went out. We actually. Uh, got flown out to do a jingle for a nice like plastic surgery <laughs> people <laughs> something wow that a friend of mine got hooked up with it and got a bunch of us to be flown out to do a jingle so i think that might have been one short foray out there since i've seen you but. um okay so I, i'm looking down because i am now uh posting Facebook does this funny thing that they don't send people notifications that were live. So I'm uh, doing that right now so people can find us and I'm posting it. There you go. Um, so Kenny, before we get into like all your stuff, wh were you, what were you doing when, when COVID hit? Like, were you, did you have stuff booked? Were you on the road? What what was going on in your life when COVID hit? You know, Vicky, I I mean, I I have I mean, basically, I've been involved with the Yardbirds right for about four, maybe going on five years now, and it's six years. Like, oh no, five, could, yeah, five, about, yeah, yeah, probably about five years yeah, now, yeah. <clears throat> and. Um, and really, I mean, things have been actually fairly slow in general. I mean, I'm not doing the work that I used to do. It's just not there. Right. Um, and I've been doing more session work that I do online just for various people that you wouldn't even know of, basically, you know, just uh, and local things, uh, things with people that I've gotten involved with since I moved down to Pennsylvania. My buddy, Dave Osekinen, who's the drummer from the Hooters. Right. Uh, we became really good friends. And through him, I got involved with a lot of really great musicians down in this area. So, you know, I, I get, I've gotten involved with a, a different crew of people than all our old friends from New York City. I'm not really up there hardly anymore. Once in so, a while, like once in a while, I go up to do something, but you know, it's not much these days. How did you? What made you quit Brooklyn and, and move to Pennsylvania? Well, Brooklyn, I quit a long time ago. At Brooklyn, okay. I quit when I when I met my well, you met my ex girlfriend that you knew, Benita. Right, Benita. Um, I had lived in Manhattan for over twenty five years, and you know, um, but when we split up, it just. You know, I've been, I had worked with, you know, John Eddie, sing a songwriter, John I, Eddie. I certainly do. You and I, I came to see you play with John at least a right. couple times with Louie. So, Louis, right. Louis. so yeah. and, and actually Louie, I think, was playing drums. And he was part of the reason why I got the job with John, which goes back to 1995 or 1996. Wow. So, so the, we're jumping around here, but, uh, working with John Eddy was, you know, ultimately my connection with the Jersey thing. And when I broke up with Benita and I left Manhattan to go to Jersey and yeah. I've been working with John ever since. So I haven't been in Manhattan in a long time, actually. Right. I mean, I was, I, I, was working with John Louis. Louis would take me to John Eddy gigs and take me home back to Manhattan while I was still there. And 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 the price for that would be three double cheeseburgers from, <laughs> from McDonald's. So that, oh my God. For, the, for the ride back. But but um I don't know. I mean it's it's the whole the whole ride for me is is pretty I mean, I can organize it for you, but we're jumping around now. So. We, 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 we don't have to organize it. We can jump around. You but know. I was just curious, like when COVID hit, did it, well, disrupt, when co you, did, did it disrupt your world? Like, Actually, you know what? No, I mean, well, like I'm saying, I wasn't that busy anyway. I was always doing sort of, I had like a bunch of things that were just 
you can sort of depend on being there. Right, but I mean, the, uh, like the Yardbirds didn't have anything well, in the books, or well, the Yardbirds. The last two years affected the Yardbirds. Right. So, so this, so two years ago, everything got canceled. It was supposed to be I'm, this is it was what supposed I'm to be about. this year got canceled again. Now oh, we're yeah. working on trying to do it for next year. Oh, so okay, for so the last two years, the Yardbird stuff has gotten canceled. Ex this is what I'm saying. And then a lot, and John Eddie got canceled. I mean, or John Eddie decided, I don't really talk to him very much. I haven't yeah. talked to him, to be honest with you, I have not talked to him in a long time. Uh -huh. But uh, he's been living in Nashville. Right. And um, since COVID, it just all just shut down. Exactly. This is now, what my now point John, was. Now, John, you know, he has to fly in from Nashville now to do stuff. Right. So it could be maybe he doesn't want to get on a plane, which I don't blame him. I don't particularly feel like flying these days either with what's going on. So how, ha how have you guys been, you and Cheryl, been living during COVID? Like, did you take it seriously? Did you stay home? Did you, do you go to movies? Do you go to indoor restaurants? What are you doing over there? No, we do not do a lot of that. We mm -hmm. don't do a lot of it. She's particularly paranoid being in, in the health system as a doctor. Right. So mm -hmm. she's got to be really careful. Right. And she's got her kids. Um, we mask up. We're all vaccinated. We're doing the right thing. It's the way we feel that the right thing is. Right. And uh, we do go out every so often. And, and you know, it's strange because uh, where I live, and I'm not passing judgment, mm -hmm. but, you know, we'll be wearing masks and a lot of other folks won't be. Uh, and, yeah. and we're just like, okay, you know, what are you going to do? You know, I mean, it is what it is. So, uh, and, you know, I'm almost 70 years old. So I got to be careful about, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively healthy for my, for my age, but, you know, I got a few little things. I got to, you know, be careful. Right. And can't be stupid, you know, so I've got to, I got to, you know, do, do what I got to do. You know, it right. is what it is. So, it is what it is, and you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I mean, we, I'm post, I mean, we yeah. go out, we go out to eat. You know, we go out here and there. But uh, I mean, we don't. We haven't been going to movies. We'll go to a, we'll go to some local restaurants here and there. We go out to see some music once in a while. Uh -huh. But uh, pretty much, you know, we we stay safe distance, wear a mask. You know. I mean, if you're outside, I'm not going to worry about it too much. Mm -hmm. But you know, inside we do, we do the. Let's try to be smart about it. You know. Okay, so now we can roll back. So that picture with Hendrix was total no bullshit, huh? That no, makes but you know crazy. when I saw that, I was like, oh, Vicky, Vicky gets a proper verbal spanking for this. <laughs> what? No, I'm I did no, my you due know diligence. What? But, but yeah. you know what, though? When I saw that, the first thing I thought was like the memories of seeing Jimmy at the Fillmore East. Okay. 1968 just came flooding back to me, you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, back in the day, I was lucky enough to see some amazing shit, man, you know? It's like, I did too. I was at the Fillmore was, quite a bit know. also. Fillmore you played with a like, couple, you played with people that I saw at the Fillmore. I saw, I saw Edgar and Johnny and I, and Rick. And Derringer Rick, was playing yeah, with them. Yeah, I saw them at yeah. the Fillmore. Who did you see at the Fillmore oh, back in the day? God, I mean, you saw Jimmy, huh? Wow. I saw Jimmy. I, I just saw, you know, I saw Santana. I saw the Who. I saw. Yay. I was at the Who. I was at the Who concert when it when it when the place next door caught on fire. Wow. And and Roger Daltrey, who was it? Pete. They kicked the fire marshal in the nuts. But get he out of to, here! Try to get him off the stage. Oh my God. And I was hysterical. out with some friends of mine and we were like really high, you know, <laughs> my friend gave me some two and alls. Oh, God. And I, I, I had to... never, I had never done that before. And, and, and the guy that gave me the two and alls, he was tripping. I mean, we were just <laughs> out, you know, so, I mean, you know, we were kids, you know, but, uh, oh my God. I mean, geez, I saw, you know, we saw so much of Sly and the Family Stone and, oh. You the know, film was the best. It was like the Fillmore. best concert hall I have ever been. I mean, to. I remember seeing Sly the first time they played there, and I was like second row center, and Larry oh Larry Graham's bass. 
I thought it was going to make me crap my pants. I mean, it was incredible. It was, it was amazing. You know. Were you already playing bass then? Yeah, I was playing. I wasn't playing professionally yet. It was getting close. You know, was probably I was in dust at the time. Oh, you were. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, but uh, at that point, probably uh, we were still trying to find ourselves, and probably more. No, we weren't even the trio that it became. Ultimately, we were before that. Right. Okay. So let's roll it back and get, get chronologically here. So you're a kid in Brooklyn. What part of Brooklyn are you, did you grow up in? So I grew up basically three blocks from Brooklyn college and Midwood high school. I grew up on ocean Avenue between Glenwood road and Avenue H. And so what high school did you go to? Well, ultimately I went to Erasmus because I moved to another neighborhood. Okay. So. All right. And uh, what, yeah, go ahead. Uh, were, your, were, your, were your parents musical? Did you come from a musical home? I know you have an older brother who was musical. My older brother, who's no longer with us, he, oh, was, he was a musician. Uh, and, and my parents liked music, but they didn't play an instrument or anything. But they, you know, they enjoyed opera and show tunes. And, mm-hmm. you know, I remember having the South Pacific with Mary Martin in the, you know, in the house and my father would sing opera in the shower and, you know, just stuff like that. But uh, my brother, what did he play? My brother, well, my brother was a drummer. Uh Uh-huh. And so there was an old set of Rogers drums in, in the apartment that he started on. Uh, but at a very early, and, and my brother was into rock and roll at an early age, and I inherited all the 45s that had been left from parties nice. and friends coming over and leaving their 45s there. I still have them. Wow. And, and I cherish them in all their scratchy, noisy, glory, <laughs> monophonic sound. Um, and I still love that sound to this wow. day. Do you play them? But, Yes, I do. Oh wow! Yeah. I gave my whole collection to my stepbrother. You like know, I, I have, I have, I have Frankie Avalon's Dee Dee Dinah oh on, on a forty-five. I mean, oh you know, I got some crazy, some crazy stuff. But um, so, but my brother at an early age, he mm-hmm. somehow got taken by classical music. Oh, and I don't know how that happened my mm-hmm. brother was seven years older than me so we weren't very close right okay um you know he was always older and going off with his friends and i couldn't be part of that and so uh but my brother got into classical music at some point and completely lost any interest in pop music wow and um he studied and went up there was a system in new york city that was like this orchestral music i I, all i know is that it was there was this 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 thing called the all borough orchestra sure and then there was the all city orchestra Uh and my brother went through all that and then ended up going into juilliard wow and then he studied that is the toughest school in America and so I've heard and I've been mm-hmm. told that by other people that went there mm-hmm. and my brother went to Juilliard and my brother ended up playing in the New York Philharmonic and he worked yeah. for quite a few years under Leonard Bernstein what as a drummer as part of the percussion section wow yeah I mean wow. he studied studied timpani loved loved he was totally mad for timpani you know um wow Wow, Leonard Bernstein, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My brother was uh, my brother was trained the expression, you know, to read fly shit. You know, he could just <laughs> he could read like he was a reader, right. but he wasn't the type of guy that would improvise or play really out of the orchestra. Uh huh. Like he didn't do he didn't play in a band with people. He didn't. This thing was going to play symphonies with the orchestra. Wow. The Philharmonic. That's what he did. Put did it that on a, imp- he put on a tux. Influence- wow. 
Wow. No, it did. We were like, I, I, you know, it's weird because I love classical music now, uh -huh. but but when we were young, we were fighting all the time on whose time it was to practice. And okay, so you were both playing drums. Well, at first I started to play drums, and we had uh, moved to another neighborhood and I couldn't get away with making the noise anymore. <laughs> it's amazing that my parents weren't evicted from the from wherever <laughs> we lived because you lived was, in apartments. We lived in apartments. Wow, with, drums in an apartment is crazy. Neighbors and echoing into the courtyards. Wow. And and um and how were you how were your from, parents from with both that? of us my with, parents, were your parents I, so were they okay with it? They must have been. I don't know how they put up with it. Oh, I, I really, when I when I think about what what we must have done to them. Oh my God! Because then I started to play bass. When I discovered bass, you know, I was always I was always rhythm section oriented. I was okay. always, you know, I always heard bass and drums. It was always rhythm section. I I mean, I loved drums first, mm -hmm. but I always I. You know, my father built a homemade, he made his own, he didn't have a stereo. We had a high fidelity monophonic sure. system. And, sure. he, and he, built, he built everything himself. Wow. But I just remember hearing and being drawn to the bass and going to my favorite pizza place and listening to the jukebox pumping oh, out bass <laughs> and listening to Motown records mm. and hearing the bass. It just got into my blood. I just was always, you know, it wasn't pianos and it wasn't guitars. It was, I just heard bass and drums, you know? And to this day as a bass player, I just, I love drummers, you know, like I, I love hanging around drummers and I love talking to drummers about drums and I love watching them. And I love, you know, all the drummers that I've worked with over the years, you know, I'm always. I was just going to you know, ask you. Discovering, getting, you know, locking into people, you know. This is getting, we're getting unlinear now, but we'll come back. Who, who are some of the, who are some of your favorite drummers to play with, Kenny, over the years? Well, my God, I mean, you know, when I was growing up. You played with up, everybody. Well, I mean, the people that I've played with. Right, well, that's what I'm asking. I mean, I've played with so many great people. I mean. Uh, but who, when you, well, when you well, get for, to it? I mean, well, one of the early, one of the greatest drummers I played with early on was mm -hmm. with Dust was Mark, Mark Bell, Marky Ramone. I mm -hmm. mean, he, he was an amazing powerhouse with incredible chops at a really young age, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, when you see him with the Ramones, he does that gig great, but he really is capable of a lot of other shit that he right. used to do, that we used to do with Dust. Right, You right. know, because we really covered a lot of ground. I mean, a lot of ground. So we were hard rock, bordering on metal, progressive. I mean, and Mark was, Mark was like, uh, I used to always think of Mark as like the combination of Mitch Mitchell and Elvin Jones. I mean, mm. he was... Really, but uh, so early on, but uh, I mean, look, I mean, all the people, I mean, I've, I've worked with uh, Tommy Price and Kenny Aronoff or uh, mm -hmm. Carmine Apice and, and Corky Lang. And mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I mean, and I don't mean to, you know, if I'm not mentioning people, it's just because I'm- You're not thinking of them, I got can't it. Think, but right. I mean, I've, I've, I've worked with so many great drummers, so many great drummers. Okay, so so roll it back. So so you start playing bass. So how do you get how do you get your first bass? How does that happen? How did that happen? Yeah. How'd you get it? How old were you? I was 14. Um a kid in my junior high school had a fender bass that I when I saw it, I just flipped out of looking at this thing. And I wanted to play it. I just, this is what I wanted to play. I don't know if I really understood the concept yet at that time, but I needed uh -huh. to have this instrument. And I bugged my mother, you know, just drove her crazy. <laughs> and, and although I didn't get a Fender bass, she bought me like a $50 Japanese version of one. Okay. And what happened was, now here's an interesting story. So I got that bass when I was 14 
and I didn't really have anybody to play with yet. And I was just plunking around on it, not really knowing what to do with it. Uh huh. Now, my brother, who was going to Juilliard at the time, he had some friends. Those friends were forming a band. And that band was the New York Rock and Roll Ensemble. Uh, and those guys used to come over to my house every so often because they were buddies with my brother from Juilliard. Right. And the, one day the bass player, Dorian, said, can I borrow your bass? He needed a bass for rehearsal and I wasn't committed to it yet. And I let him have the bass. And then at some point later, he just wanted to buy it for me. And I said, no, I think I want to try really playing it. So I got it back. And then I just somehow started to learn how to play. I think one of the first you, bass lines I learned was Mr. Tambourine Man or something. You know? did, you, uh, did you study or were you self-taught? No, I was self-taught. Um, what happened was, I moved to another neighborhood where I met some people, my, you know, young kids, mm -hmm. my own age that were forming a band. Uh -huh. They needed a bass player. I had mm -hmm. the bass. <laughs> I started getting together with them and learning songs on the bass. And um, I still talk to some of those people today. You know, I'm still, and, and that's where I met Mark Bell. It was through... I went, I, I went, I moved to another neighborhood that involved a different junior high school that I had been in. Mm -hmm. And this junior high school was where Mark went to school and these kids that I met. And I sort of found people my own age that were actually actively trying to put bands together. And, you know, at that time, bass was like, the, oh, you play bass? Really? That's what we need that. You know, people were playing guitars. Everybody, you know, you right. went to the ventures. Right. Uh, but bass <laughs> wasn't so, and I happened to have the bass and was trying to learn how to play it. So I found a place so in to- the days So in the days before YouTube, you just play in songs over and over and over, or you, ha or you, you records. have it in your head and you're able records. to- Records, records. Mm -hmm constantly put it, picking up the needle and playing it over and over and over again and again oh, that's your what parents say, must have loved that poor too. Parent. <laughs> you know and then that. and so and the other thing was so i moved to this other neighborhood in another apartment mm -hmm. and now i'm playing the bass in this apartment and there was these do you have and so you have an amp you have an amp to go with i your had bass. an amp and my brother was practicing drums also and the, oh. there was this guy that lived on top of us who wanted to kick our asses <laughs> on a daily basis. He hated us. And he used, oh. to, drop, he used to drop his barbells on the floor <laughs> when we were practicing to complain. <laughs> so I'm telling you, I can't believe my parents put up with us. Holy shit. Wow. My, yeah, my, they... parents, my parents were saints. My mother was a saint. Did your parents live to see you have success, Kenny? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. That, I gave, when, when I when I got a gold record, uh, when sto stories, oh, so, so when gonna... Brother Louie went to number one and <laughs> stories, we we played at Carnegie Hall, opening up for the Raspberries, and we got presented gold records, and I gave my mother the gold record to take oh. home. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's. Okay, so so you you play the bass. You're you're teaching yourself how to play the bass. Is Dust your first band? Dust is the first band that I made records with. Dust was the first professional foray into the business, and that was really the start of my you know career. And, but before that, you know, you're playing in little cover bands, and you're well. I never really played in cover bands. I played in bands that just you know played the local Jewish center. Yeah, we we <laughs> did cover tunes, but. I, you know, we hardly ever worked. It was just more, it was more like practicing more than working. You know, we know a lot of people that grew up really working like the cover scene. Right. And playing out and really like early experience with nightclub life. I never had that. I never had that. Mm. I never, like, see, 
I think that that would have been a lot different basis if I had that experience where so? you, well, I, I, cause I grew up, even though I grew up with the English invasion with the mm -hmm. Beatles and the Stones, when I started playing bass, it was when I was really into people like Cream and more like heavier impro stuff. improvisatory, mm -hmm. you know, improvising, jamming. It wasn't about playing the top 40. I never right. learned top 40. It was years before I learned top 40. I was never that. Subsequently, if I had learned top 40, I would probably be a lot better in, a, in certain ways, just having had that experience at an early age. I just wanted to play my bass and just, I didn't want people telling me, and, I, and the people I play with, we were the same way. You know, right. Dust, Dust did what we wanted to do. If you told us you wanted us to do something, we would have told you to fuck off pretty much. <laughs> and that's the way it was. We, you know, um, so, you know, but, you know, you and I, if you think about all the people that we know that are still around at our age that started at the same time, a lot mm -hmm. of people came out of playing discos and clubs in the early days of the Long Island scene or the Jersey scene. I never left Brooklyn. I didn't know about Long Island and New Jersey. I didn't know any of that. I didn't even know about the discos in Manhattan. I didn't see the Rascals or Billy Joel back in the early days or the Ronettes at the, at the Peppermint Lab. I didn't see any of that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, I just had the experience the way that I came up in it and sort of had to play catch up later on with that kind of stuff. Okay, so you come up with with dust and I mean you, you, you break out with dust and how do you go from dust to stories, which was okay, so dust and stories were on the same record label, Buddha Kama Sutra, and we had the same manager a guy named Dominic Cecilia, uh -huh. managed both of us, managed both bands. So what happened was Dust was splitting up. Because? Because Neil Bogart, the president of Buddha Kama Sutra, wanted mm -hmm. to groom our guitar player and our lyricist as producers. And Stories was floundering at the same time. Uh -huh. sto stories had done a second record that wasn't doing anything. Mm. And so they were having issues. St stories founder and main musical antagonist, Michael Brown, uh -huh. he, he quit. Michael Brown was, you know, left, left bank. Right. Pretty walk ballerina. Away, walk, walk away, walk away Renee. Renee, pretty ballerina. Right. He quit stories. Okay. So now stories is floundering. Dust is floundering. So they took, so Dominic Cecilia, the manager, took me, put me into stories. And what happened? So now I'm in stories. So what happens is back in those days, I used to do session work here and there for right. Buddha Kama Sutra. Uh huh. So there was an act on Buddhist, Buddha Kama Sutra that was going to be produced by the two guys from Dust that were being groomed as producers. I know this sounds confusing. So they didn't know who to hire as session people, so they hired the guys in stories to play on this track for this other band. The other band was this band called Exuma. I don't know if you remember them. I, I don't remember Exuma. They were, they had some minor regional hits. Okay. But they were from the islands. They were mm -hmm. from the island of Exuma. And uh, stories were hired as session players. Neil Bogart, the president of, of, of Buddha Kama Sutra, he got the song Brother Louie, wanted it to do it with Exuma. Stories was hired as session players to record who, who, those tracks. Brother Louie. Hot Chocolate. Oh, okay. They wrote, and, and mm -hmm. they had, they had, they wrote it. The two guys, I forget their names. They wrote it. 
And they actually, and they released it first in Europe. So stories were hired. We went into Bell Sound Studios. We recorded Brother Louie for the band Exuma, produced by the two guys from Dust, Richie Wise, our guitar player, and our lyricist, Kenny Kerner. Mm -hmm. And then when our singer, when Story's singer, Ian Lloyd, he put down a scratch vocal for the other band singer to, to learn. Right. And when Neil Bogart heard our track with Ian's vocal, he said, fuck Exuma, this is gonna be the next Story single. And that's how it happened. And so, so what, all of a sudden now you're in stories. So what they did was they took Brother Louie, put it on the second stories record that wasn't doing anything and re-released it. Ah. And then the song, I don't know what the album actually did. And I was never on the original album. It was the right, you were old, on the song. Mm -hmm. but I was on the single that they right. added on and then re-released it. So that's how that happened. And so that had to change your life. I mean, <coughs> having a number one has to change your life. What, what, what was that? You were still just a kid. How old were you when that happened? I was like happened? 21. Jesus. <clears throat> 21. So, yeah. so what is that like? You're getting a gold record. You're, you're, you have a number one. Well, you know, we, we, worked, we worked for like over a year on the strength of that record. Mm -hmm. Then we did another album. And... You know, Stories was always sort of like a arty, more progressive, more arty, serious kind of a band. But once we had Brother Louie, the record label just wanted more Brother Louis. Yeah. So we were kind of forced to do some other tunes like that, which made Ian Lloyd, I know he was very unhappy about mm. it. And uh, <clears throat> um, so we did a third record called Traveling Underground, which is really a good record, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not a top 40 record. And mm -hmm. yet there is these two <laughs> blatant <laughs> add-ons that we were made to do <clears throat> that were in the, in the style of Brother Louie, but nowhere near as good. Mm -hmm. And it just did, you know, it, it just flit, flitted out at that point, you know. Okay, and so, so then, so yeah. when this, when this, when, how did, how did it end for you with stories and what was the next, Derringer wasn't it, what was the next thing you did after then, stories? So, so after stories broke up, um, so after stories broke up, the keyboard player from stories was friends with the keyboard player who at the time was playing with Hall and Oates. Ah. Hall & Oates was looking for a bass player because their bassist, who was Rick Laird, who was a monster, Mahavishnu Orchestra guy. Mm -hmm. Rick Laird, tremendous bass player. I actually took a few lessons from him. Uh, he was leaving. So I got into Hall & Oates through the connection of Story's keyboard player being friends with Hall & Oates' keyboard player. So I did one tour with Hall and Oates. And they were huge then, weren't they? No, they were not. Oh. This, was, this was before they were huge. Oh. And they had a really kind of uh, oddball, left field sort of record. They had done this record called War Babies. And it was produced by Todd Rundgren. And, wow. and it was not commercial in the sense as how we know and love Hall and Oates. Right. Not there yet. <laughs> Not no. there yet, but okay. they did have they did have Sarah Smile uh -huh. at the time, mm -hmm. but that I think was only kind of a regional thing for them. That it's mm -hmm. Sarah Smile was re-released sometime later on when you, it became really big. Right. But they had had it they had it out earlier, if I remember correctly, and it was just sort of mm. you know wasn't a hit hit. Right, right. So I I I did a tour with with Hall and Oates. Uh, <laughs> And we opened up for Lou Reed. Oh my God, where? Oh, I don't remember. East Coast, you know, okay, kind uh -huh. of East Coast reach, you know, just, uh, I don't really remember exactly. Maybe some Midwestern stuff, you know, nothing too expansive. But uh, 
That was very strange. That was a very strange combination. And um, it would be where whole notes, you know, at that time, whole notes was also known as an acoustic duo from what they had done earlier. Uh -huh. and, and then so they, I think Daryl and, and John would come out and do that first. And then the band would come mm -hmm. out and do this War Babies record. Mm -hmm. So their dying on early fans were not, it was almost like Dylan going electric. Right. People didn't want to hear it. Right. <laughs> and then we're on the on the on a tour with 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 Lou. So you're really talking a strange juxtaposition of fans and music and it, it was it was a job. It was, well, it, was a, was Lou it was a gig. But just, wait, I gotta tell you this. At the yeah. end at the end, you know, so so you you know who was managing Paul Notes at the time was Tommy Matola. No shit. Yes, and at the end of the tour, they I'm didn't... surprised he didn't want to make them more commercial. I would think he would like push them to be commercial. Well, I'm telling you, this is early on. This is this is 1974. It's 1974. Like yeah, yeah. So at the end of the tour, I didn't get paid. So I. <laughs> this is a funny story when I tell people this. I actually took Tommy Matola's small claims court. Holy shit. Why yeah. didn't he pay you? He wouldn't pay me. He just felt like, you know, you know, go go away, kid. You bother me. You know, it's like. Wow. Yeah, so I actually had to go to small claims court. Did you win? Yes, I did. Okay. I mean, cool. you know, so uh, I, when I think back to it, I go, geez, you took Tommy Matola. I mean, that could, be, <laughs> that could have been dangerous. That be a career breaker right there. <laughs> yeah, could be a also, leg breaker. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, that too. But uh, you know, and then so so I did that, mm -hmm. and then um, I got a call about auditioning for Leslie West. And, and is that when Mountain was huge? No, oh, this is after. after this after that's Mountain. after Mountain. This okay. is after Mountain, and mm -hmm. this was. This was during the Leslie West band period of which there were variations on that. So um, I Carmine? don't- Carmine? Was it Carmine? No, this was no. Leslie and Corky. Okay. And I don't remember who was there before and playing, <clears throat> excuse me, playing rhythm guitar was Mick Jones from before Farnham. Wow. Yeah. Holy so. So I got called up to do an audition and I ended up going to some rehearsal studio in somewhere in Manhattan. I don't remember where it was. And there was a whole bunch of people ahead of me and I was just sort of hanging around and hanging around and people were coming in and people were leaving. And I was the last guy in. And I think I was playing Mississippi Queen and uh, uh, Leslie stops and says, you, you got the job. You know, what, what's, what's your name? Uh, Kenny wow. Erickson. He goes, you're Jewish? I go, yeah. He goes, oh, great. We have another Yid in the band. <laughs> it, it was like, you know, and so I stopped playing with Leslie, you know, and then uh, so, so, but so I, I play with Leslie and then at some point uh, midway, kind of near the end, maybe, there was a weird falling out with Leslie and Corky, and Corky quit. That's where Carmine came oh, in. Oh, I see. Place. So that was the first time that I played with Carmine. But now Carmine and Timmy Bogart were heroes of mine from mm. Fudge and the Cac Cactus and Hell those, yeah. those bands. So mm -hmm. I was like, geez, you know, playing with Carmine. So, yeah. Wow. So that, that's how that happened. Uh, okay, wait, so Tony wants to know, is that picture with Ginger Baker a real picture of you? Is that really you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, how did that happen in 1968? So, so uh, back in those days, all the English bands coming over in 67, 68, they all mm -hmm. stayed at the Gorham Hotel on West 55th Street. That was the place where they all stayed. Okay. And I had... I had these friends that that somehow found out that Cream is staying at, at this hotel and blah 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 blah. And we all went there and we just hung out until they came out of the hotel. We met them. 
and they let us come up and hang out with them. I mean, I gonna, yeah, because that was, was uh, like, that wasn't outside that picture. You guys are in. We were in. That was the Gore Motel. It's now probably luxury condominiums. <laughs> <laughs> and what um, band were you in then? What were you doing then? I was still at that point. That was like 1967, 68. I was mm -hmm. just starting to play with Dust. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I mean, there's a picture of, I don't know. Do you know who? Uh, I had a friend. He's in, there's a picture of another friend of mine, and there's another picture of me and another guy. And it's this guy, Elliot Michael, who now owns a very successful vintage guitar business. And he's in Nashville called Rumble Seat Music. Mm -hmm. And he's in that picture of me. We were best friends. We lived across the street from each other. We used to jam in his basement all the time. And it was these friends of ours that found out about Cream staying there. The Jeff Beck group used to stay there. Oh. We went there to hang out. We met Jeff. We met Ron. I hung out with Ronnie and Rod Stewart. I, I took a walk with them through Central Park. My buddy and I tried to get him back to Brooklyn to have like some real mm -hmm. Italian food. My, yeah, I mean, it was like they were, and they were like, you know, they were older than us, but they were almost like kids themselves, you know? Yeah. I mean, wearing their crushed velvet pants <laughs> and they had the great hair. I mean, Ronnie, oh, yeah. Ronnie and Rod. And, mm -hmm. and I still remember, you know, Rod's like a major uh, model railroad fanatic. You know, I I never knew that. I just heard that recently. You need to look it up and see what he does or what he's done. Even then, when I went up to his room, he yeah. was building a model. Oh, stop. Railroad. On the road? <laughs> On the road, he had model wow. train that he was building like a, a he was making a box car, like building wow. it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's crazy. I still remember that. He's oh totally the model train fanatic. I think it's great. <laughs> Did you ever get to play with any of those guys? No, I've never played with them. Well, I mean, when I auditioned for the Stones, I got okay. To, we, well, you know, all right. So, but we now you're really to, jumping. I, we're jumping, and we'll go back. But you have, since we're here, you have to tell that story. You have, because, you know. Okay, so Dan Hickey, an old friend of ours from back in the day, yes, wrote me this Dan, morning. Another great drummer. A great drummer. And Dan said, did you, did you know that, and I'm not going to tell what the punchline is. And I said, no, you're kidding. That didn't happen. And he said, wait, I'm waiting. You're going to have to oh, ask God. him. And Jeez. so, so I said, all right, I'm going to ask. So, all right, I'm asking. So tell right. me about your Stones audition. Okay. Well, so I found out that it was happening. Okay. What, wait, this is 93? 93. Okay. 93. I was playing with Joan Jett. Okay. And I found out they were auditioning. And at that time, there were a bunch of guys from New York that were on their crew. David Rules, one of them. Um, and I was trying to figure out how, how do I, how do I, how do I inject myself into this equation <laughs> here? I got to get it shot. Don't so now, wait a minute. Is it is it word on the street? How do you know that the Stones are auditioning bassists? It's you like, know is it out I, on the street? What's going well, on? You know what? I mean, I used to rehearse a lot at SIR. So uh -huh. if you were hanging around SIR, you would hear shit. Right. Because right. everything was revolved around SIR. Okay. So uh, um, something, you know, I was trying to figure out, well, I can't, I don't expect ever to get the job, but I've got to at least get a shot at it because I will, could not live with myself. So wow. um, there was a guy named Bud Tunick, who was a friend of mine who was involved with running Nile Rogers production company. Uh -huh. And of course, Nile was involved with, you know, new Mick Stones, a lot of interconnection stuff right. going on there business wise, uh -huh. production wise, you know. So I, I, I think I, I, I went and asked my friend Bud Tunick, hey, can you do something he goes sure he goes why don't you get me a picture give me a, a cassette a cassette at the time cassette of like you know a bunch of you know like 20 seconds of a bunch of things that you played on and i'll pass it along so i i got him the cassette and i and the picture i sent the picture i gave him was me in a gondola in italy going under the bridge of size 
on, on a visit to Italy that I had just been on. And, and why I, that picture rather than you It was a great bass? picture. Okay. It was a great picture. Okay. It was just a great picture. I figured, you know, yeah. if Mick sees this, he could appreciate it, you know. Okay, uh-huh. So, so I sent it in. And, and you had your hair in those days. I had my big hair. Oh God, yeah. I had my big hair and uh, uh, big ego. <laughs> <laughs> and a skinny malink. Skinny malink, because we were also we were doing some bad things back then. <laughs> I, didn't have, I didn't have any fat on my body at that point. No, you did but, not. Um, but uh, anyway, so I, I, I sent that in and all of a sudden I get, I, I'm, I'm, it's a Saturday, I think it was a Saturday morning and I'm home with Benita and I was in the shower mm -hmm. and Benita comes into the bathroom and goes, somebody representing Mick Jagger is on the phone. You got to get out of the shower. Mick Jagger wants to talk to you. And I get out of the shower Holy shit. and I'm just buck naked <laughs> and I'm sitting on the couch and I pick up the phone and it's Mick. Jesus. Telling me that he heard the tape and he saw the picture and he wants me to come down. Wow. And he's looking forward to having, you know, he saw my resume, really looking forward to having me come down and audition. Holy shit. So then I- So now wait a minute, you're buck naked. You're talking to Mick Jagger. Talking to Mick naked, <laughs> naked. Right, perfect. But it had, I mean, even with ego and all, that has to be a thrilling experience. It was totally thrilling. It was, yeah. It was totally thrilling. It was, yeah. you know, it was just like, I, I, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. It was like, yeah. And then uh, after that, I, I don't even, you know, I, I remember, I don't know if they contact, if, if the guys that were involved in the audition contacted me but i was you know somehow i so i was in touch with the people that were dealing with the daily goings on of trying to put this whole thing together because they were going to try a bunch of people and it was all right. happening at sir mm -hmm. and it was going to be a bunch of songs a little old a little middle period a little new uh -huh. things you know it's going to uh -huh. be a variety of tunes so i remember i think it was david rule that I said, hey, listen, can you get me in like later on if possible? And he said, I'll, I'll you know, and he was gonna try, he was gonna help me out with that. And actually- So you wanted to be remembered. You didn't want to be- Well, no, I wanted, I didn't want to go in like when it was all first starting and I was hoping to get an idea of what tunes to learn so I could I see. You know, sort of be prepared. Mm -hmm. So what happened was David, I think it was David that was able to hook me up, you know, did me the favor of, mm -hmm getting me in at some point, maybe I was like number 14 or something. And every few days he would call me and tell me what songs to learn because he'd be there every day hearing what they were doing. So by the time I went in, I pretty much knew what uh -huh. they were trying out on people. Uh huh. So, uh, so I went in and I had this really hot pink jacket that I had bought on a tour in Japan with Joan. I had this really great, really cool jacket and you were stuff, always you know, styling like you know, crazy. well as soon as i walked in the guy said kenny ditch the jacket he did not want me going in looking like that why is that not really quite sure i guess they felt like they didn't want people coming in Looking trying too to upstage Mick or, or something. Or trying to look like you're part of the band or. Mm. So mm. I, I got rid of the jacket, but underneath I had what I actually wore on stage with Joan, which was a cut off jean jacket. So I was still comfortable and, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> I go in, it was on the sound stage and uh, I'm kind of, setting up my my shit and you know all of a sudden you know actually before i went in ronnie came out to greet me nice. and he couldn't have been more charming i mean ronnie yeah. ronnie was great mm -hmm. totally charming and uh and then when i went in so ronnie was there and then charlie came walking in and keith <laughs> keith comes in and Mick comes in and 
Keith says to me, would you like a drink? I got a cooler full of stony, you know? And I was like, now, you know me, I'm a, I'm a drinking man. You're a drinking man. <laughs> and I turned it down. No, you didn't. <laughs> yes, I turned it down. Get out of here. I turned down a drink, yeah. I can't even imagine such yeah, a I can't imagine. I can't believe I did that. Apparently, he talks about it in his book or something. Really? That's what I heard. I haven't now, read the whole thing. But. Okay, so did you lose the gig because you turned down the drinks, do you think? It's possible. I don't know. But <laughs> so here's the story that you So did you hear. turn it down because you didn't want to you didn't yes, want to compromise was, your Yeah, I actually play, thought yeah. I, I'll be on my good behavior and be, you know, yeah. I, you know, it's like I felt like, yeah, I'm doing an audition. I'm not just going to take a drink, you know. Right. You know, I was so freaking nervous. I wish I did take the drink, you know. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, but this is the story that you want to hear. Yeah. Yes, I we're, do want to hear. <laughs> we're playing. Mhm. Mm and I'm kind of on the side where Bill would have been. Okay. So it's like, if you're on stage, looking out to the audience, you're mm -hmm. on the left. Okay. And then there's Keith, and then there's Charlie, and then there's Ronnie. Okay. And Charlie plays pretty light, at least it seemed. And Keith has got this wall of amplifiers. <laughs> And I couldn't quite hear what I wanted to hear. And I, you know, I was a little kind of awkward about asking about what I might need in my monitors. And I, you know, it was just, yeah. you, know, not, you don't know how to quite sure. how to react, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually asked Keith if he could turn down a bit. No, you didn't really do that. I yes, mean, Dan I said that, I oh that. my I Actually, God. I, it was fucking loud. It was like it was like sharks with laser beams. I mean, it was like holy shit. Yeah, it was almost like a barrier of sound that you couldn't hear what was going on on the other side. What yeah. What the hell? What was his reaction to you? He it was no reaction. He was he was just he just like laughed or something. You know, I, I, there was no reaction. It was nothing weird. It was just like like. I think he even might have said, oh, oh, okay. I only remember it was, it's such a, well, it's sure. such a blur. It's such a blur, but I, I you know, I, I don't always tell that story, but yeah, I actually, it's a good one. I actually had the balls to say that. That is the Just fuck. Like, and, and did he turn his music down? Tony's asking, did I he turn down? I don't remember now. I, I don't <laughs> remember, but it was really hard to hear them because he was really like loud. <laughs> And it, it, it created like, you know, and I was trying to, my nature is to try to lock in with the drummer, you know? Right. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right philosophy in that band, <laughs> uh, but um, I'm curious. I mean, I never met Bill, so I never had a chance to ask him and I don't know right. Daryl Jones. So I, I've never asked him what, what's it really the dynamic of the whole thing, but um keith was like this barrier of sound that was it was and because everybody else was was low lower in mm. comparison and and it was just hard to kind of get a balance of everything and i should have just you know done what i would do normally if in a situation go hey can i have more of this in my monitors can i have more you know but i just you know when you're you're there with just with the stones I mean, like and you ask Keith I'm like, Richards to turn I'm, his guitar down. I'm, I'm blindsided by all this, you know. <laughs> turn down you the know. booze and asked him to turn it down. Turn, yeah, I, yeah. I got, I got to think. So, no matter how you played, you weren't getting that fucking gig. <laughs> uh, you know what? I was happy just to be there. So we took a break, and 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 during the break, I just, I was, I was talking to Keith, and I said, you know, I just want to tell you that. Uh, you know, you guys are my heroes. This is just such an honor to be here with you. And Keith just goes, oh, man, we're just a garage band that got lucky you know, <laughs> in that voice. Uh, you know, they, I tell you, they couldn't have been more. They couldn't have been more charming. How about Mick? What was Mick like? Mick was totally cool. Wow. Totally cool. And, you know, where I'm playing all these songs with them. Oh, yeah. So how, how, how much time did you do? How, I played with them for like, like an hour and a half. Holy shit. Yeah, and I'm playing all these tunes and, wow. and and like we're all like sort of in a you know on stage together and Mick is doing his Mick thing <laughs> and and 
you know, and you know what, you know, it was amazing. You know how these people are, are like so much larger than life to you? Yeah. I couldn't believe how little they all were. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mick's, it, a, I've seen Mick. He's a Mick, Mick was thing, built like course. a two by four. Yeah. He had no, he was just like, he, he was like incredible. And Keith, they, they, they were just, they were just great. All of them were great. Charlie was very quiet. You know, every mm -hmm. so often he would just turn around and give me a little smile, you know. I mean, it just. How it, was it playing with Charlie? I mean, how was it playing with Charlie? I, I, I wish I could, I wish I could have heard him more. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's why I wish I, I, I wish I had the confidence at the, at the moment to ask for something, you know, that I felt, I mean, there they are in SIR, you got full sound and lights, you know, you could have really anything you wanted. Right. But you're so like, you, you don't know what to do. It's almost sure. like you don't know what to do. Sure. It was crazy. You know, you felt like you're in this, in this realm of like, like you're in this light with these people that are just Jesus. so, so, you're like, what am I even doing here? <laughs> you know, you really felt like you're, you know, for, for whatever I've done in my life, at that point, I realized I'm here and I'm with these people that are just yeah, that's, it doesn't really, get, it doesn't really get special, yeah, really it special. I mean, this is the shit. These people, these are the people that, this is like God, you know? Oh God, have you, you know, ever, I mean, did you like, ever bang into any of them again after that? No, I don't think I, um, no, it's, uh, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I've worked, you know, and I've worked with Chuck Lavelle mm -hmm. as a keyboard player, you know, mm -hmm. be before all that. Uh, but, um, and Chuck wasn't there at that point. Uh, in fact, Mick was playing some keyboards. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, there's a, there's, it was like, you know, you, you, you're going, you know, in my life, I'm thinking, yeah, I've done this, you've done this, I play with this one, play with that one, I play with all these great guitar players. Then you go in and you play with the stones and you're like, <laughs> you feel like crying. You feel like a little, Jesus. like a little girly man or something. It's like you, you these are the, this is the big shit, you know? Yeah, like, that's the big shit. And you know shit. what? I was just so happy I could have been able to do it. Yeah. So. But and you also you got to play with with George with with George Harrison didn't you? I recorded yes I recorded with George Harrison. Um, I mean that's kind of like playing with God too. What was that like? So um, I was working with Dave Edmonds in the mid eighties, mm -hmm. and Dave got uh, a gig producing the soundtrack for the last Porky's movie, Porky's Revenge, and. Uh, he used me and Michael Shreve on drums and Chuck Lavelle. Mm -hmm. And we went out to LA to do the soundtrack. And what it was, was so this group of people did whatever the music was Dave was going to do. And then the fabulous Thunderbirds came in without a bass player. So I played bass on a track with them. And then some people sent in tracks like Jeff Beck didn't show up. He, mm -hmm. he sent in sleep, a version of Sleepwalk. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Robert Plant sent something in. Uh, but, uh, but George Harrison came in to do, um, I, think it's an un I think it was an unrecorded Bob Dylan song called I Don't Want to Do It. And he came in to do that. And uh, so I had was out with Michael Shreve having dinner mm -hmm. and we were, we were out having dinner and having some cocktails and we came back to the studio and you know, I had my, my hair was happening. Mm -hmm. Come back in the studio and there's George. And George just sees me and he, puts his arms around me and he starts telling me, oh, yeah, I used to have hair like that. You know, <laughs> I reminded him when he was like a teddy boy or something. Right. 
And, and um, we ended up hanging out, you know, before we played and we were all just, you know, sitting around and actually George had some blow on him. And, nice. And so we did some of that and we were just, you know, sort of passing it around. And, uh, but what was funny was, um, here we are, you know, snorting a little blow and mm -hmm. hanging out. And um, somehow I was telling him some story about when I was a kid, how I wanted the Hofner Beetle bass really, really bad. And I used to even hang pictures of up on my bedroom wall, you know. <laughs> and, and, and in the course of the conversation, I was saying something that made me end with like saying, God damn it. And when I said that, George goes, naughty, naughty. <laughs> wow. And I'm thinking, wait, but you're doing blow. <laughs> and you're telling me. <laughs> it was just, but uh, George was really cool. He was really nice. I mean, uh, we did this track, you know, I remember him. He was sitting down like on a carpet with his legs crossed when mm. he was playing. And uh, we did this track and it came out really well. And uh, you know, I mean, what's the track? It's, it's called "I Don't Want to Do It," and it's on the Porky's. Okay. It's on the Porky's Revenge Porky's. soundtrack. Right, but it, it, it also got it also got re released mm -hmm. on a later uh, some kind of George Harrison compilation record. I don't know what it's called. There's another version of it. It's sort of the same track, but somehow I think another solo was added onto it. There's something different about it. Mm. But uh, no, it's a it's a great song. It's a great tune. Um, okay, so now let's let's so let's back out. So you you were out with Hall and Oates. What happens after Hall and Oates? After Hall and Oates, I got I got contacted to, to play with Leslie West. All right, so, that was Leslie West. So, then you do the Leslie West thing. Did the Leslie West thing? Then that ended. I know there's a Derringer coming here. So oh, I have I have a funny Leslie West story to tell you. Oh, good. When, when I got the job with Leslie. I got notified to come up to his manager's office for a, for a brief meeting. And his manager said to me, Kenny, use this as a stepping stone in your career. Do not lend Leslie any money and do not, and do not lend him any guitars. Wow. And he goes, and you'll be just fine. <laughs> That's hysterical. Yeah, that was, that was, that was the advice I got. So did you heed that advice? Yes, I did. And subsequently, I heard a lot of stories about having to do with that from people after me and just shit mm. that Leslie used to pull with people because, mm. you know, I love Leslie, but he was a scoundrel. Wow. <laughs> you know, but he was brilliant. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, he's Leslie West. He was, he was, a, he was, a, he was a piece of work. Um, but so, um, so after that, Mm -hmm. um, I was back home in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and, and one morning, I get a call, and it's, hey, it's Rick Derringer, and I'm like, had you had you met before? Nope, never no. met him, never met him. And Rick uh, told me he goes, uh, I'm putting a band together. He goes, I'd like you to be in it. He says I have to go down to Louisiana and check out a couple of musicians. And I and he said, when I get back, I'll I'll be in touch. And what he was doing was, so he he had in mind he wanted to use Carmine Apice's little brother Vinny. Uh huh. Vinny was down in Louisiana playing with Danny Johnson, mm -hmm. and Rick wanted to check out Danny Johnson, so he went down there. What what Mike, year is this, Kenny? This was seventy six. Mm -hmm. So Rick. Uh, found, well, okay, Vinny's great and Danny's going to work. So he came back and we put Derringer together. And that took up another three years of my life. And we just toured and toured and toured and toured. That's all we did. We played every shithole bar <laughs> and every Enormo dome that existed, uh, traveled around in a station wagon with a Wow. A U-Haul truck with a couple of roadies in the gear. You know, we did every wow. major tour that was going on at that time. We did the Aerosmith Rocks tour. Foreigner. 
Pat Benatar, Boston, Frampton during Frampton Comes Alive. That's recording. crazy. We That's, did. We wow. were the opening act on all those tours. Wow. And when we weren't doing those, we were off doing clubs on our own. Now, how and, was it when you were opening for like Peter Frampton, stuff like that? I mean, Rick was already a massive you know, he, he was Rick Derringer already. Rick was a force. Yeah, a so force. I would imagine that the audiences were totally receptive to you guys. Totally, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. totally. We were, you know what? We were like the, the most amazing opening support act, and yet mm -hmm. we could never get a record that worked to get us airplay on the radio. Really? Could never do that. Wow. Nothing, could never, that... Like live, no problem. Anywhere we played, no matter if we were headlining a club mm -hmm. or opening act for whoever was huge at the time. Right. We always got an encore. We always, or gave the, op gave the headline of problems sometimes wow. too. We were strong, mm -hmm. but we never could make the right record. We never found the right producer that mm -hmm. could figure out what to do with us. That was the, you know, as a live act, we were unstoppable mm -hmm. and yet we couldn't make the right record. That was, mm -hmm. the, that was the downside of it. But, you know, it was, it was a great, well, we had, you know, and, and um, we were second on the bill to Led Zeppelin for two days in a row on Bill Graham's Day in the Green in wow. 1977. Um, that, you know, People still post pictures of that stuff on Facebook all the time. That was that incident when that was that fight that happened with Bill Graham security people and the Led Zeppelin people. Do you remember? What no, remember what that? happened? No. Oh, there was some weird thing that went down backstage with Zeppelin security and Bill Graham's people. Yeah, it was. And then I think right after that was when like Robert's kid died or something and they had to cancel the tour. You know, mm. so but uh, oh, man, yeah. With 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 Rick, mm -hmm. that was well, like that was like the heyday. You know, the the really intense everything going on in that mid to late seventies period. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah. opened up for Oreo Speedwagon. We opened up. I mean, you name whatever was the huge band going mm -hmm. on at that time. At some point we were on their tour. And you were driving around in the state. No, you were driving, driving around. Yeah. Driving around yes. station wagons and a U-Haul truck. Yeah. Wow. Just a, just like four guys in the band, a tour manager, a couple of roadies and a, and a, a truck full of gear. So yeah. now what ended that relationship? Why'd you um, Well, I don't know. Rick just sort of let me go in the middle of a record which was fine, actually. It was probably time for that to happen, actually. Mm -hmm. It was almost like time for Kenny to maybe fly or something. It was, yeah. the, it was the best thing, actually, that, that happened. Because at that point, Rick was kind of, uh, I don't think he was focused anymore. Mm. Um, just getting involved with different people and just kind of, I don't know, it was just, time for me to move on and just well, uh, he, it was that that's before when he found religion isn't it that's before he found religion that is before that yeah mm -hmm. yeah but um no listen you know like the three years that i worked with him man was very intense it was it was great there was some serious rock and roll yeah and, uh, you know i just uh you know you whatever whatever place there was to play in the country we played it i mean it was like and more than once you know a lot of those places are gone now, you know, mm -hmm. torn down. The Spectrum, Kingdom, you know, a lot of, you know, yeah, incredible. You think so, back. And so after Rick, what so after you... after Rick, I started just, you know, I'm a side man, and I'm, you know, floating around from gig to gig. I played mm -hmm. with uh, after Rick. I actually I did a tour with Edgar Winter. Uh, played with Edgar for a little while. Mm -hmm. Um, do you remember Suzanne Fellini? I do remember Suzanne. I, I played with Suzanne. I did a tour with her. I went to Europe with her. When did and you then, play with Graham Parker, which I didn't know about? Graham Parker. I love Graham Parker. I wait. You know what? Um, 
brain fog. So Graham, okay. I I played with Graham. Jeez, uh, I can't remember now. There's like uh, around 1990, I guess, or so. Mm. Um, God, I saw him. A like like in the in the nineties nineties, yeah. I worked with Dave Evans. I worked. I toured with Mick Taylor. I worked with Graham. Somebody asked, "What was that like?" With Mick. With Mick Taylor, yeah. Oh man, well, Mick Taylor was always one of my favorite guitar players. Uh, Mick wasn't uh, a particular happy camper at the time I was playing with him. Mm. Um, I think he had, I think he was straight at that point after whatever he'd been through with the Stones. Mm -hmm. But you know, he was he wasn't easy to get along. We got along eventually, but it was a little little strange at first. But you know what? Mm -hmm. I mean, that guy, Mick Terrell was one of those people that all you had to do was play two notes and you know it's Mick. You know what I mean? Yeah. That to me is a God-given gift. Yes. You know, to have a sound that just comes out of your hands like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm really happy I got a chance to play with him. I mean, um, it wasn't always easy. Mm -hmm. But I got to play with another person that I really admired, which was the keyboard player, Max Middleton, who mm -hmm. was in the rough and ready version of the Jeff Beck group. Uh huh. He was playing keyboards and he was just amazing and a really sweet guy. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, John Paris was playing guitar in that band too. No kidding. Yeah. So we played, we all played together. Well, you know, it was nice. The first time nice. I saw John was as a bass player when he was playing with John. Johnny. Was a great yeah. bass player. John mm -hmm. John Paris was, a, was a, I hate to say it, but sometimes I'm like, "Fuck this guy, man! He's like, <laughs> this would piss me off. He's so good. You really, <laughs> oh, John is great, man. Uh huh. John was yeah. great. I saw him play a few times. John was with great. Johnny. He was great. Yeah. But uh, talk about playing loud when John played guitar. He was the loudest guitar player I have ever heard. John Paris? John Paris. John Paris loudest. played loud and he wore earplugs. Yes, and, but he played loud for everybody else. And it was right. like, wow. I know. Yeah. Funny. <laughs> no, I used to, you know, when I was living in the city, I'd come out and play with him every so often. That, you know, when it was at the BBs or, or, you know, I mean, before that, I can't. You play, I'm sure yeah. you came, I'm sure you played with him at the Rock and Roll Cafe. I have oh, that great yeah, picture. Yeah. That great picture of you playing with Tommy Burns and with Louie at the rock and roll. And yeah. Huey got on the thread today and he said, he's playing my- I saw that. Um... I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, that was, uh, <coughs> and, and then uh, what was the other place on First Avenue we used to, didn't, didn't, wasn't there a place on First Avenue that- uh, I don't I used remember. To play, I used to play with Red Sedan also. Remember Red? Mm -mm. No Red? Rockabilly mm -mm. guy? Wow. Okay. No, but you were playing with George Worthmore when I first George met Worthmore. you. Well, I, I used to play at Dan Lynch's with George. And you also played at the Rock and Roll Cafe. And I kind yeah. of phased you guys out because I was moving the, the, the rockabilly out and I was moving the rock and roll in. <laughs> George, I, George I see, him on face, see him on Facebook every so often. Okay, so how did uh, the Joan Jett thing happen? Um, the Joan Jett thing happened from... So, uh, were you friends with Ricky before you you did Joan? We were acquaintances, mm -hmm. not really friends. I mm -hmm. wouldn't consider a you know we're acquaintances even mm -hmm. even now. I was never really close to him in any way. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, Tommy Price and mm -hmm. I. I got a call from a friend of mine that was in the business at the time. Mm -hmm who hooked me up she asked she said she had an artist coming into new york city from mm -hmm. france mm -hmm. who wanted to use a new york band or a new york rhythm section to mm -hmm. do a record with she goes do you have a drummer you work with that you can come down and audition for this guy and at the time i guess i had been working with Tommy, I God, you know, you know, Vicky, it's weird. It's like you remember certain things for so long, and then all of a sudden, and without without like my resume in front of me, right, it's like, it all blends all of a sudden. <laughs> so I'm I'm sorry if I'm if I'm having a brain fog. Not at here. all. Um, 
Tommy and I were doing something. I forget mm -hmm. what it was because mm -hmm. he was the guy that I thought of first based on whatever we had been doing. Okay, wait, so I still have to go through everything. So it wasn't when you were doing um, Billy Squire, Billy Idol, Brian. Uh, oh, okay. So it was so Billy Idol we had played with. Okay. So that was 87, right. Mm -hmm. So so after Billy, that would have been the most recent thing I'd done with Tommy. So when this happened, that's why Tommy came to mind. And we got the job and we did this record for this French artist named Etienne Daho. Mm -hmm. And he brought in some people that he worked with and then he used me and Tommy as the rhythm section and paid us really well. And, nice. um, and then Tommy, I don't know if it was to return a favor or, or what, but mm -hmm. Tommy turned around not, not soon after and said, hey, Joan's looking for a bass player. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, sure. And again, I just, uh, you know, uh, revolved around SIR. Joan was rehearsing at SIR. And mm -hmm. um, I went down there and just, just got the gig. It just worked. I didn't, I don't know, you know, if they were auditioning that many people at all. I just came in and learned shit and got the job. You did that for a while. I did it for almost like four years. Almost. Yeah, that's a long like time. Yeah. So how was that? And she was at the height of her fame in those days. No, she? her biggest oh. stuff came before that. Her biggest stuff really came early with when, 80s, early yeah. with Ricky Bird yeah. with right. that with that right. original band. Right. But I really liked Joan and I, I liked playing it, but uh, the, it was a little hard to, I didn't get along with the management too well after a while. Which John Ken, Iosa, I knew John Iosa. No, Kenny Laguna. Oh, Kenny Laguna, Kenny oh Laguna. my God. Kenny, Kenny was Laguna. so protective of Joan. Yeah, oh, very, my. very protective. Oh yeah. But, uh, and you know, there was a part of Kenny that I actually really liked because Kenny had been around in the business at a time that I could ask him about hey, Kenny, do you know who played on this record back in the day? And he would know this stuff, you know, like right. on Four Seasons records mm -hmm. and shit that I was into, like, you know, older stuff that I was really into. So that part of Kenny, I actually really enjoyed. But he, um, you know, his way of doing business was, uh, mm. and we came to Loggerheads because, um, he came to the band and invited us to write stuff for a new Joan record. And I wrote a song. I wrote everything, the, everything, the mm -hmm. music, the lyrics, the melody. I went up to the office. I sat down with Joan and taught her how to play it and mm -hmm. everything. And he basically ripped me off for everything, you know? What? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So, you know, and, and because I stood up for myself, mm -hmm which meant me getting a lawyer, well. I guess that was the end of that gig. That was the end of it for me. Mm -hmm. Once I did that. Yeah, yeah. Which was fine, because you know what? I played with him for four years and I, it was fine. It was time to move on anyway, so. Uh, and actually after that is when I started to play with Graham, I think, uh, with Graham Parker actually. Did you do it, you did a tour with Graham? One tour, and we did a live record from the bottom line. Ooh, yeah. It's called Grand Parker and the Episodes. Mm. Did Damn. That. And that was another situation where we had a problem with a, the guy that you're working for who doesn't want to pay you. Oh. And the whole the whole band had to get go to the union and get a lawyer just oh, to, yeah, just to yeah, get yeah. Graham and his record label to pay us. For, I mean, hey. it's like. You know, and, and I really, I loved Graham. We got along mm -hmm. great. It was a great little band. Graham was totally cool. Loved him. Loved mm -hmm. the music. He was a great hang. Great to travel with. To I mean, and then right at the end, it's like something has to come into the equation and spoil it, you know? Wow. It's like, you know, and it wasn't me. You know, it was the whole band. It was just all, I'm so sorry to hear like, that. You know, it's like, God, what is, what is like... <laughs> Why can't okay, so things work out right? 
so talking about things, so we have to talk about Bob, about Mr. Dylan and how you got that gig. And I have a little story of my own with that. So how did you get the Dylan gig? So um, I got the Dylan I mean, was gig. He, were you, were, were you, because for me, he was God, like, like the Beatles were God. And he was God well, to me. Was he for you? So before, no. No, no, not a god. No, you weren't into no. you weren't folk music crazy. I was folk music crazy. Oh no, I I like I like you know this and that and this and that, but maybe mm -hmm. not that. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. like I love his Infidels record. You know, there mm -hmm. are things that I love, and then maybe things that, and there's probably a lot of shit I haven't even heard. You know. Oh come on, Free Willing Bob Dylan. There's nothing better than that. Oh stuff. no, I, oh, I love the old stuff. Oh, I love the god. old. Shit. Yeah, I love the old stuff. I mean, I love all this, the. The old shit. Well, but that's what I'm saying. He was yeah, he was yeah. a he was a guy. He was anyway. So how'd you get the gig? Well, okay, so uh you know that was my 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 eighties adventure was you know was Billy Squire in eighty one and then uh, uh Hager and Sean and then uh you know Brian Setzer, you know, this was all and then Billy Idol. And then after Billy, Bob. So um, that's a really big detour that you took from that other kind of music because that other stuff is very different. Yeah. Well, you know what? That that's I I listen. I've had quite an adventure as a as a side man. I mean, there was a period of years where I played so many downstrokes with a pick. Where if I had just a penny for everyone, I'd be a, <laughs> a very wealthy man. I mean, it was almost like I had a, you know, when I, you, I would go from, you know, there were periods where I went from extremes. Like there was my, you know, in the eighties, I did a lot of, well. You're slapping, you were a fucking You know, fucking at one point, I, you, oh, yeah. you know what? And now I couldn't even, I can't even do that anymore. You know, I just don't do that. God, but you know, between me. between Billy Idol and Joan Jett, I mean, I was you know, but so with Bob, uh, I was hanging out at at Benita's office. She remember the you know remember the Cable Building on Houston and Broadway. Mm -mm. You know you know the Cable Building. It's a famous building. I don't think so. All right. Well, Broadway. anyway, so. So Benita had an office there mm -hmm. and uh, I went down there to meet her and we went downstairs somewhere to a restaurant to have dinner. And her assistant called down and said, somebody from representing Bob Dylan is looking for Kenny. Holy shit. <laughs> so we got, we got the phone number, I called them back. It was like somebody from a lawyer or management mm -hmm. or something and they said to me can you be in this studio tomorrow at such and such a time and i was like yeah and it turned out i had to go to montana studios remember montana studios on 11th avenue yes i do so i went there and i walk in and it's ge smith and chris parker on drums that's it. No Bob. And these okay. guys start teaching me songs. And then I get asked to come back the next day and they teach me some more songs. And then I came back a third day and they're still teaching me songs. Wow. And then I think the fourth day Bob shows up. Wow. And I'm just playing these songs. I mean, there's Bob. Well, what, what was what was that? Doesn't doesn't say much. Doesn't say much. Doesn't say much. People hanging around from the crew. I'm not even sure who everybody is. Uh, he's not playing. He's just. He was playing. He started he playing. playing. He oh, started okay. playing. But he but he didn't show up for a few days. I'm just mm -hmm. there learning songs. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I get asked, 
you available to go on this tour and it's like leaving in a matter of i don't know a week less than a week wow and they go is this amount of money okay and i was like yeah and that was it and i all of a sudden i, I take a picture with them which you had on right. your thing that was uh -huh. the picture picture of me and bob for the tour book and boom off i was it was just that fast and was he an enigma the whole time did did he no, stay but, on his separate? no he actually was pretty personable and on the road he was he was actually very cool um, uh -huh. um but when i went back the second year to play with him which is when i found out i had melanoma and i had to leave because that's how i lost the gig i had a I had to leave because I needed to take care of my health. Um, that tour, he was the enigma. The okay, you know, so like, I, you, I don't know. It must have been the, the, before that tour when you were rehearsing for that because you invited me to come up because I told you how I felt about him. You invited me to come up to the studio. I don't remember where I got off the elevator. I started to get off the elevator and you stopped me and you told me to go to leave. You said you don't want to meet yeah. him today. I, I don't remember that, but if that was that second time around, he was he was sneaking up back stairways. He always had a hood over his head. He wasn't talking to anybody. He wasn't giving mm. any direction. There was really very little communication. In fact, what was strange about that was when I started the rehearsals, he had um, Mindy Jostin, the fiddle player. Do you remember her? From New York? I don't. She was, um, she came down for like a few days playing fiddle and nobody knew like everybody was saying to themselves is this girl going on the road with us is she on the <laughs> tour is she not on the tour nobody wow. knew what was going on and then right before we went out to go on the road she was gone and she wasn't part of it hmm. um so but that that was the weird thing that happened with me where um i i told them as the, you know, I told him on the way to the airport, I said, mm -hmm. you know, I have to leave to deal with some shit. Right. But it's not a big deal. I'll be fine to come back in a month. And they all said to me, don't worry. We love you. You got your job. Take care of what you got to take care of. When you're ready to come back, you come back. And uh, I got invited out to, uh, so they got Tony Garnier to take my place. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now you got Tony, you got Chris Parker and you got GE. So now you got your little Saturday Night Live mafia going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wow. You're bursted. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. I got invited out to sit in with the band at Jones Beach. So I went out on the bus. I with remember the that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I went out on the bus with the, with the crew mm -hmm. and everybody was telling me how much they miss me and they want me to come back and they hope they come back and yada, yada, yada. And uh, I, I'm hanging out and Bob says, to, you know, Bob wants me to come and have a chat with me. And he goes, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't really <laughs> feel like changing bass plays now, you know? Yeah. So he was telling me and I'm like, yeah, I know. When you're off the bus, you're off the bus, you know? Oh. And that's what happened. So then, this is before I went up to play with him. And I'm like, now I'm like, fuck. Oh, yeah. Now I'm like, I'm supposed to go up there and play and be like, I'm really right. happy right now. I just right. lost my gig, you know? Yeah. So I called, I called my girlfriend and she goes, you fucking stay there and go up there and play. <laughs> you know? and she was like, no, you go up there and play. And I did, you know. Yeah. But that was it. Over. That was it for me. So, but you know what? It was fine while it lasted. Hey, look, you know? yeah, you got to play you know? with Bob Dylan. I'm you got sorry. got to play that's, with Bob, you know. That's and, and the great. music. And you know what? And, and that little band that we had was really great. Mm -hmm. It was just really stripped down. I just saw G.E. Smith band. on something. He was, he's yeah, always, he's, he always he's, weirded me out, actually, to tell you the truth. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I never really warmed up to him. I'm personally. not, I was never close with him in any way. I mean, I got mm -hmm. along, we all got along on the road and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, just travels in different circles. Um, by it the is way, what so it is. It is what it is. Terry says, I love Kenny's work in A H S A S. Piece of oh, my heart okay. cover on that album is still one of my favorites. What was it like working in that band, especially with Hagar? Um, that was like a, a so so what happened? Oh, you know what? Now I'm, I'm there you go. I'm, stuff is coming back. So mm. so that that came about. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know? So I was playing with Fog Hat in around 1983. Oh, that's right. I loved Foghat. Yeah. I, I did their very last tour. I wonder if I they saw were, you. Yeah. And they were opening up for Triumph. No, that's not what I saw, okay. And after the tour, we mm -hmm. went down to Atlanta mm -hmm. to do some demos with um, a very interesting producer cat whose name just eludes me at the moment, but someone okay. very, someone very well known. Mm -hmm. um, and we were doing some demos and I just figured, yeah, you know, this is what I'm doing. And, and I really like those guys. I mean, I, I loved Lonesome Dave and, uh, you know, uh, Roger Earl, what really sweet, sweet, great people. Mm -hmm. And um, I get a call out of the blue and Sammy and Neil are putting together this project and they want me and Michael Shreve, they want me to come out. They want to put me up, take care of all my expenses, give me a chunk of cash and give me a piece. And we, they want to do this record. And so I had to do it. The Foghead guys were a little miffed that I did that, but I mean, I, there was nothing going on with them at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just, had to, I just had to go and do it. So um, went out to San Francisco, went, went out to Oakland, San Francisco, and then worked in Oakland at the Journey uh, sort of complex. And, and Sammy and Neil literally wrote this record on a daily basis. I mean, every day we would go there and Neil had this music and Sammy would sit on a stool, just be coming up with lyrics out of, you know, that's, it just was this thing, this flow. Hmm. And we're just putting this thing together out of the air, on the, basically. On the fly. Uh -huh. Kind of, yeah. I mean, Neil was just coming up with music and Sammy's just, coming up with lyrics and mm. it was like these guys are like and what happened was over the years i'd see those guys on the road like mm -hmm. i'd see sammy when when he was with uh, montrose even back in the day or, wow you know, and and uh, neil would journey and you know they they used to say to me hey uh, one of these days kenny we're gonna do something you know we're gonna do something and, you know, they, they called me and uh, they were both on hiatus from their respective careers, you know, whatever they had been doing at the time. Journey was on old, Sammy was, you know, and they just figured this is the time to do the project. So, the, but the concept of it was, <laughs> was not to tour, was to try to do a record, record it live, videotape everything, put it out like that, and uh -huh. try to sell it like that. as like an extended form video live show. And uh, it didn't work. Mm. We should have toured. That band should have toured. It would have mm. been unbelievable if we took mm. it out live, but they mm. didn't want to do it. Or maybe they couldn't because they had other things that- Was Sammy could, doing Van you know, Halen that? What, 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 what year? No, that was before. No. It was before. before. Yeah, I'm not sure what Sammy was doing at that time. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was. I can't. I can't remember quite at this point. Right. But, um, and and maybe we couldn't do it because maybe Neil was committed to Journey at some point. So we right. you know. But but uh, I I just the thing with me is I was glad to do it. And, and my only regret was, was like, it was this guy, it was like these guys were like little play project. 
I don't think they really took it seriously enough. And for you, it was your gig. To me, it was yeah. like, man, we should take this out and really do this as a real band. Right. That way, I think it would have generated way more record sales. Everybody would have made more money. At least Michael and I would have. Right. And, uh, you know, we might have made more of a, a, uh, an impact. But, you know, so, so it goes. And again, uh, so next, <laughs> right? So now, all right. So well, we've been talking forever. So we have to talk about the Yardbirds. How did this come into your life at this point in time? Did you see that picture I sent you? Which one? I sent you one in an email earlier. Wh which, you sent me three pictures. What picture are you talking about? And then I about? sent you another one. You did? Yeah, you got to see that. That's, that's, it's funny because that, that to me is like fate. It's, okay, it's wait, me. I'm coming back and I'm looking. Go, yeah. go look, go look at your last Oh, email. one more pick. I just yeah. saw that. Go, okay. Oh, look at that. you with the Yardbirds album. All right. I'm right? going to post this on the thread after the show. I didn't see that before. I so, oh, wow. You know what? That's I got to tell you crazy. something. When I, when I was growing up, uh -huh. I That's was crazy. Yeah. absolutely out of my mind for the Yardbirds. The Yardbirds wow. were my favorite fucking band. Wow. I lived and breathed Yardbirds. I had records and I had all the records in mono and <laughs> I didn't stop playing them. Wow. And Paul Samuel Smith was like my favorite bass player. And I loved Clapton and I loved Jeff Beck with his fuzz tone. Me and too. I loved yeah. all their tunes. I loved mm -hmm. the rockers and the more ethereal tunes. And I just loved the Yardbirds. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, uh, I went to see them some years ago at B.B. King's, an, er an earlier version of the band, because they've been through a lot over the years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I briefly met Jim McCarty and Chris Dreha was still there at the time before he had a stroke. Mm -hmm. So these are like two of my heroes. Right. And then... You know, some time passes by, whatever it was, you know. And John Paris one day sends me an email about something, you know, something musical. And then at the end of the email, he goes, oh, by the way, I think the Yardbirds might be looking for a bass player. Why don't you contact Jim McCarty on Facebook? And... You know, I'm the type of person that, you know, some days I'm like really feel like crap and I'm really insecure. And Okay, you know, now wait a minute. Why wouldn't John go for that gig himself? I mean, he's a great bass player. You don't know. Okay. Don't know. And okay. I'm sure, and I'm sure he sat in with them and played harp whenever they were in New York because that's what he does. Mm -hmm. You know, he's John Paris. It's like yep. Mr. New York, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Saturday night. You bastard. <laughs> I'm coming up to play with Harp with you, whether you like it or not, right? But no, I love John. John's great, man. Um, so I, I was in a good mood and felt good about myself. And I said, why, I will contact you. <laughs> Gosh darn it, I will. So I, I sent him a short message. I said. On Facebook? Yeah, I sent him a personal message mm -hmm. and I just said, we met a few years ago. I'm a really good friend with John Paris. I said, I've been a huge Yardbirds fan mm -hmm. since I'm 14 years old. I said, it's my favorite band in the world. John, I, I, here's just Google my name. I won't bore you with the details here. Just Google me to see what I've done. Mm -hmm. And I said, if you need a bass player, I'm available. Got back to me three days. He said, you got the job. Stop. You didn't even audition? No, I did nothing. You just said you got the gig. Wow, Kenny. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was just like, and I got to tell you, you know, playing those songs. I mean, <laughs> and then I look at that picture that I sent you. Oh, my God. And, you know, that's, that's, that's the shit that I love about. It's like the universe, you know, somehow. I mean, it's like I joke. It's like my 50 year old dream that came true. You know, it took, it took 50 years, but I got the damn gig, you know? You got but, the damn gig. And I saw yeah, you, I've yeah. seen you as a Yardbird 
at least three yeah. times, I want to say. I mean, and I, and I love it. I love it. You know, when I turn around, I look at Jim playing and I just, mm. you know, and, I, and I'm playing all those bass lines that I used to, you know, listen to and want to you know, play along with. And, and, and uh, you know, now Godfrey's playing guitar. Oh, I was band. just going to say that. So old friend Godfrey is. Yeah, uh, yeah. So John Johnny A was playing with us for a few years, and then he was uh, really snotty to me at the at your live gigs. By the way, John, jo Johnny's a great Johnny's a great guitar player, but uh, he's better off having like his own thing. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't fit. He's not play. a team player. He's not a team player, but he's a great mm -hmm. guitar player. I never say that. Mm -hmm. no. Yes, well, he but, was great. But you know, um, after after three years, it was just Jim felt like we needed to change up, and and Godfrey. Godfrey's just, you know, she's such a sweetheart, man. It's just, just a pleasure. The last time I, I saw love Godfrey. Godfrey was not that long ago. He was the musical director for the Happy Together tour. And I was going to see Howard Kalin and Godfrey was back there. And the, the castles, a lot of my friends were there and he was great. Yeah, you know, Godfrey is like, he's, he plays great. He's, he's just, uh, you know, no issues or anything. It just gets along with everybody and it just makes everything easy. And, and I'm trying to remember when I, he, when I first met Godfrey, he was playing with John Entwistle. Am I wrong? Was no. He? He's, yeah, he played with, yeah. Man, Godfrey's played with amazing people. Jeez. I gotta get Godfrey on the show. I remember that. He was, he was with Entwistle at the time, I think. You should get ladies. him on. Yeah, because yeah. he's played with so many great, I mean, he's played with Jack Bruce. He's played. Yep. Yep. He's played with some seriously heavy duty people, you know, really Absolutely. real musical, real musical shit. So is it a different experience with God doing it with Godfrey? It's, it's just the overall vibe is just a little less tense than it was. That's mm -hmm. all. No, I mean, we all got along in the past. It's just, mm -hmm. uh, there was just things that were going on that I think Jim just felt like he couldn't really deal with and he just mm -hmm. needed to. You know, so Jim, Tony's Jim, writing that you're you guys are are booked for 2022. Apparently, they're booking stuff. You know, who knows what the hell's going to go on, right? Yeah. I mean, I really hope I hope it works out. I've been waiting now. Do you miss playing? You must yeah. miss playing. I do miss playing. I mean, there are certain things. I, I mean, you know what? I, I. I want to just do things that make me feel good. I don't want like to do that. things because I have to do it for money, even mm -hmm. if I don't, you know, I don't want to, as long as I don't have to do that, I'm okay. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'd rather, I just try to do things that I really like, I you know, you, you know, even on a local basis. I mean, I don't want to be in bars all the time just to pick up a few bucks. If I don't really, I, I just, I can't, deal with it anymore it's just mm -hmm. not what i want to do you know so what okay so, so kenny so we're, we're getting to the end here what would you love to do so here before you've had a big past you have a big history you've played with a lot of people you've played incredible venues you've you've you were there when Frantum comes alive was being i mean you've done amazing things right so is there something, is there anybody, okay, so the Yardbirds was like a 50-year dream come true. Is there anybody you have yet to play with that you would still like love that experience? God. You know what, when you, you know what, I, I don't really think about it much. I, you I, know what, because you probably, you probably hit all Oh, you know what, oh, I didn't tell you actually what I've been doing though. Okay, tell me. I, what I've been, now this is something a little different for me. Mm -hmm. So I've been playing, now you probably don't know who it is, Okay. but I've been playing with this amazingly wonderful guitar player, mm -hmm. one of the best freaking guitar players I've ever played with. Wow. His name is Steve Kimmock. Do you know who How Steve do you spell Kimmock that? is? I don't even know how to look it up. K-I-M-O-C-K. Mm -hmm. Look okay. up Steve Kimmock. I'm gonna. He's out of the Grateful Dead jam band world. Okay. And he's fabulous. Well, first of all, he's an amazing musician, like mm -hmm. real musician. Mm -hmm. But he he plays rock, jazz, blues. He's country. He's all he can do so much. 
he studied Indian music. He can hear microtonally. He plays great lap steel guitar. He's a fabulous guitar player. I never knew about him. Mm -hmm. And I got involved with him through my friend Dave Orsikinen, who plays drums with the Hooters. We were going to play with him. It didn't work out with him because he had too many commitments with the Hooters. I'm working with the guy. I just started doing this this year. We don't work too much, but we're, mm -hmm. we're going out in November for some shows. We're playing the Ramble up in Woodstock. We're going to be doing some shows. We're doing some hot tuna dates in December. But what's great about this is it's, it's this guy, Steve Kimmock, and then mm -hmm. another guy, the other guitar player, Singer. Mm -hmm. And part of it is sort of a rootsy blues kind of thing. And then part of it, which is Steve Kimmock's thing, is a little bit more open and adventurous, and a little fusion-y, mm -hmm. allowing for jamming and for creation on the spot. Nice. Never the same thing twice, which I have not been able to do for many years because wow. I've always been playing somebody's songs. Uh huh. But now I get a chance to actually open up and listen, and you gotta listen and hear what people are doing and reacting in real time. Like I wanted to do when I was 15, 16, 17 years old. Right. And I haven't done that since then. And I'm wow. doing it now. Wow. So that, that's, that's actually, now I hope that we continue to play and I hope they'll do more, more stuff. But right now for what it is, uh, it's all really cool people. Uh, it's almost like a little family operation. And uh, Steve's 30 year old son is the drummer. And he's incredible. This kid wow. plays his ass off. Wow. Really, really, really musical. Not, not like, uh, you know, not like, you know, head banging shit. This is like some really cool it's stuff that I really normally don't get a chance to do. Wow. So that's, that's like the latest thing that I've been doing. That's really looking, cool. What kind of venues are you got? Are you doing little clubs? What are you we're doing? doing uh, we're doing like uh, medium size. Well, this mm -hmm. summer it's been outdoor, some outdoor things, mm -hmm. and uh, there'll be like medium sized stuff, I suppose. I don't know mm -hmm. what Hot Tuner is doing, but whatever they're doing, it'll be those places. Probably, you know, medium sized theaters. Yeah. I didn't even know Hot Tuna was, I saw Hot Tuna. Yeah, I know. I didn't know they were still around. Still around, still around. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, Jack Cassidy used to be a big hero of mine as well. Yeah. But um, uh, so that that's the latest thing that I'm doing. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that will continue. And then I'm hoping that the Arbor stuff will happen, you know. So that, you know, that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, I always kid around, and go, thank God for Social Security. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what, I'm telling you, Medicare, <laughs> I've been going to doctors and getting Yes. Medicare is like the best. It's That's the best, the best thing about getting old. I know. I know. I like my insurance. I like my insurance. I like my Medicaid. And, and I like my social security check every month. It just helps. You know, it, it eases the pressure. It does. And <laughs> that, that's, know, the, that's the thing that can keep you, you know, that's, that's the, that stuff can, can keep you from going, oh, good, I don't have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't have to go there. I can, I can, I can say no to that, you know. I, I don't mean to sound, you know, it's just no, at this point, it. you try, I like to try to at least, I, I like to feel I, I have the luxury to pick and choose a little bit, you know. Yeah, of course, to do the things you love. I think I mean, I, I mean, that. but but at the same time, I'll tell you that I don't play enough and I wish I was playing more. I mm -hmm. just want it to be stuff that I really want to do, you know. Right. Like, right. for instance, this, you know, like, can you see that? Yeah. There's my steel guitar. You know, I wow. play my, you know, you know, mm -hmm. it's like I play my Hawaiian guitar. Uh -huh. So I do a lot of that at home. You know, Vicky, I've been I've been recording a lot of music at home on my Good. computer, on my uh -huh. system, and doing a lot of stuff, instrumental stuff, where I do like a almost like Santa and Johnny meets Dwayne Eddy kind of thing, and and. Uh, so, you know, it's, well, I occupy myself down here. I'm really into, uh, I, I've become like a software fanatic. Like I'm always buying software and trying to figure out how to use it. And, you know, that's, I sort of like, you know, tinkering down in the, in my basement all the time. So, 
That sounds like a nice life. Yeah, you know, and then I got the two knucklehead collies that, that I deal with every day that I love. So, it sounds like you know. a good life, Kenny. You know, well, I you can't know. I can't say good night to you without just mentioning Louis Appel. And I'm going to start oh. to get emotional now. But, you know, the whole reason we reconnected after 35 years was because Louis instigated it all about 12 years ago, 13 years ago. And so I started coming to your John Eddy gigs. And then Louis I was like up. that, you know, Louis, uh, listen, Louis was bigger than life. And Louis, um, Louis sometimes was a lot to deal with, you know, like Louis and I, sometimes we were oil and water, you know, mm -hmm. like I loved the guy. But sometimes I just was like, Louis, I just, I can't deal with it right now, you know? And, uh, but you know what, Louis, um, I, I have to say, we had a lot of great times playing with John Eddy. And I think actually Louis was the guy that got me that gig, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, and I will always appreciate that because uh, I, I, uh, I love John Eddy's music. He's a great singer songwriter. I always felt should have done had, had a lot more success than he has. Mm -hmm. But uh, John Eddy uh, gave me a steady job for a very long time yeah. in a long period of flying under the radar for me where the phone stopped ringing at some point and John appeared through Louis mm -hmm. and I found this guy to play with where I worked constantly and I had a steady income coming in and I could sleep at night and I actually enjoyed the music and mm -hmm. always enjoyed playing and and we had a, a great band and what was weird was you know John and, and Louie had their their Lou, moments. Lou, everybody I and mean, Louie had well, their moments. But I mean I I saw I would be in I've been in the room when John and, and Louie would come to loggerheads and John would go right. fuck you Louie get out and fire him right there in the spot and in 20 minutes have another drummer but you know what louis eventually came back yeah. and and louis always played the show great you know and uh, i mean and we've always we always had great drummers louis louis had a special touch for a, a certain aspect of john's music that mm -hmm. was always like i always felt like yeah louis plays this this is the way it's supposed to be played and you know, it was weird. I, I don't mean to be weird or anything, but I went to his funeral and when I saw him, you know, and he wasn't talking, you know, and it's like, <laughs> you know, because Louis, Louis was always talking and it was just bizarre to see him so quiet, like, you know, not there. He was I mean, the was biggest like, pain in the ass of all those years oh, of booking that I did. Oh my God. The biggest, but you know what? The night before he died, the, the day before he died, he called me. I was in my kitchen in my pajamas and he said, come to Vegas. And I said, I'm in my pajamas. He said, jump in the car in but, your pajamas and come. Do you know so the he story? He died that morning. Do you know the story? He had a heart attack, right? But so listen to this. Cheryl was out in Vegas with me. Mm -hmm. Louis and Cheryl and I and a friend of Louis were gonna go to this all you can eat sushi place that Louis had taken me. Louis had take Louis takes everybody there. Right. Yeah. And and we came down before the show to have dinner with him. Mm -hmm. Louis didn't show up. Yeah. And it's like we're calling him, no answer, no answer. So Cheryl and I just dealt with dinner. Then we go to the club to meet everybody to play. It was a Sunday night, the last night. Mm -hmm. And we're all in the dressing room and John, you know, we're all looking, where's Louie? Where's Louie? Louis. Finally, John says to our buddy, Mike, that was out working with us, Mike, can you go get security and go, go to his room? They went into the room, they found him wrapped up in a blanket the way he used to always sleep like louis mm -hmm. would louis would wrap himself up like mm -hmm. a cocoon that's how mm -hmm. he slept because i've room with anybody that's room with him knows that that's how he slept and he he so the night before the night before all this happened cheryl and i were the last ones to see him we went oh, from God. saturday night after the show <laughs> 
We went up the elevator with Louie to our rooms. We said, good night, Lou. We'll see you tomorrow night for sushi. And we never saw him again. He went to his room and, and, he, and he passed away. Mm. We were the last ones to see him. I, wow. I mean, it's like fucking... God bless him, man. You know. Yeah. Well. Well. He was. He was a. He was a. He was a. He was a. He was just larger than life. That guy, man. I tell you that. So when I told you earlier, he would drive me home from John Eddie gigs, and he'd go, "All right, go in the McDonald's and get me three of you know." I think it was four double cheeseburgers. Was his was oh. his snack before he went home. He would, he would, we would go to McDonald's on Sixth Avenue and and Forty Something Street. Yeah, I'd get him the burgers. He'd drop me off at my place on Forty Sixth Street between First and Second. And then he'd go downtown. Yeah, he uh, he took my daughter out. He took Samantha out for lunch, me and Samantha out for lunch, just a couple months before he passed. And he called. He nicknamed her S, and he used to always go, "How's S?" He was. Louis was just special. He always he did was, that. He always had things for people's names. He always had stuff. things. He, always, yeah. he was a he was something. Kenny, you're some, and I'm and I'm grateful to Louis because it's because of Louis instigating that all of this started up that you and I became friends again in this decade. You know, yeah, in, in, yeah. in later years. Yeah, yeah. And I can't wait till the next time you're out in LA and I get to see you play again because it's I always hope, a treat. I hope that happens. I just hope things get to a point where it's somewhat. You know, I'm not ready to go to watch gigs, let alone, but, but yeah, I know. by the I time know. you get here, I'll be ready to go. And all right. thanks so much for doing this. I've been Thank trying you. to get you to do Thank this you. for years. I know. I know. <laughs> well, I guess this was the right time. So it was the right time. And I really, really appreciate it. And I love you so much. And it's so great to see you. You look fabulous. Thank and, you. And thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks, My honey. My great pleasure. We'll I be love in you. touch. Okay. Okay, Kenny. Take, Take care. care. I love you. you. Bye. Love